everyone, this is Mike History 2, and I will be continuing my history of Zimbabwe. So, on November 11th, 1965, following a brief but solemn consensus, the Cabinet of Rhodesia issued a Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was immediately denounced as an act of rebellion against the Crown in the United Kingdom, and Wilson promised that the illegal action would be short-lived. On October 12th, 1965, the United Nations General Assembly had noted the reported threats of the Rhodesian authorities to declare unilaterally, unilaterally the independence of southern Rhodesia in order to perpetuate minority rule and called upon Wilson to use all means at his disposal to prevent the Rhodesian Front from asserting independence. After the Declaration of Independence was proclaimed, UN officials branded the Rhodesian government as an illegal racist minority regime and called on member states to voluntarily sever economic ties with the new country recommending sanctions on oil and military hardware. In December 1966, the UN further added that these sanctions were mandatory and that member states were explicitly barred from purchasing Rhodesian export goods such as tobacco, chromium, copper, asbestos, sugar, and beef. The British government, having already ex adopted extensive sanctions of its own, dispatched a Royal Navy squadron to monitor oil deliveries in the port of Beira in Portugal, from which a strategic pipeline ran to Umtali in Rhodesia. The warships were to deter by force, if necessary, vessels reasonably believed to be carrying oil destined for Rhodesia. Now, some Western countries, such as Switzerland and West Germany, which were not UN member states, continued to conduct business openly with Rhodesia, and Japan remained the main recipient of Rhodesian exports outside of Africa, and Iran also gave them oil. Portugal, Portugal also served as a conduit for Rhodesian goods, which it exported through Mozambique with false certificates of origin. South Africa, too, refused to observe the UN sanctions. Now, despite the poor showing of sanctions, Rhodesia found it nearly impossible to obtain diplomatic recognition abroad. In 1970, the US declared that it would not recognize the Declaration of Independence under, under any circumstances, and South Africa and Portugal, which were Rhodesia's largest trading partners, also refused to extend diplomatic recognition and did not open embassies in the Rhodesian capital, Salisbury. This allowed the South African and Portuguese governments to maintain that they were continuing to respect British sovereignty while also accepting the practical authority of the Smith administration. Initially, the Rhodesian state retained its pledged loyalty to Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom, recognizing her as Queen of Rhodesia. What Smith and Deputy Prime Minister Clifford Dupont called on colonial government Sir Humphrey Gibbs to formally notify him of the Declaration of Independence, Gibbs condemned it as an act of treason. After Smith formally announced independence on the radio, Gibbs used his reserve power to dismiss Smith and his entire cabinet from office on orders from Whitehall. However, government ministers simply ignored him, contending that since they were independent now, his office was useless. Even so, Gibbs continued to stay in Salisbury until 1970 when he finally left Rhodesia after they declared themselves a republic. He'd effectively been superseded before then, and Smith government stated that if the Queen did not appoint a Governor-General, it would name Dupont as officer administering, administering the government. Smith had intended to have Dupont named as Governor-General, but Queen Elizabeth II would not even consider this advice. Now, during a two-proposition referendum held in 1969, the proposal for severing all remaining ties to the British Crown passed by a majority of 61,130 votes to 14,327. Rhodesia declared itself a republic on March 2, 1970. Under the new constitution, a president served as ceremonial head of state, with the prime minister nominally reporting to him. Now, as early as 1960, minority rule in southern Rhodesia was already being challenged by a rising tide of political violence led by African nationalists, such as Joshua Nkomo and Ndabaningi Sithole, and I'm not joking, that's his name. After the public campaigns were initially suppressed, many believed that negotiation was useless, and began petrol bombings, uh, which became increasingly common. In Koma's Zimbabwe African People's Union, known as ZAPU, subsequently disclosed that it had a military wing, the Zimbabwe's People's Revolutionary Army, also known as ZIPRA, and the decision to start bringing in arms and ammunition and to send young men away for sabotage training had already been made. The Rhodesian authorities responded by banning ZAPU and driving its supporters underground. 
Now frustrated by the repeated failures, nationalists also conducted a campaign of terror against Africans, murdering those who had either identified with the colonial administration or had simply failed to demonstrate their allegiance to the cause. Now to protect civilians, emergency laws were imposed and broadened the legal definition of unlawful gatherings and gave the police greater powers to crack down on agitators. The death sentence was also introduced for terrorism involving explosives and arson. A crisis of confidence soon resulted across Zapu, which was already suffering from poor morale, compounded by tribal and ideological factionalism. In 1963, party dissidents replaced Joshua Nkomo's authority and formed their own organization, the Zimbabwe African National Union, also known as ZANU, which worked out its own strategy for getting international help, undermining European power, and achieving a complete breakdown of order. By August 1964, ZANU was also banned, uh, because of widespread intimidation. Now, ZANU's agenda was inward left looking, leftist, and pan Africanist in nature. In the Baningi Sidho and communist Robert Mugabe, its most prominent leaders, demanded a one party Zimbabwean state with majority rule and a public monopoly on land. After being forced from Rhodesia, they continued to operate in exile, creating occupation groups representing urban workers, miners, and peasant farmers. After the Declaration of Independence, ZANU officials mapped an elaborate plan for the liberation of Zimbabwe, which called for attacks on European farmers, destruction of cash crops, disrupting electricity in cities, and petrol bombings. They had also formed their own armed wing, the Zimbabwe African National Liberation Army, known as ZANLA. Now, in April 1966, two ZANLA units, having received prior training at Nanjing Military College, crossed Rhodesia into Rhodesia from Zambia. They were armed with SKS carbines, hand grenades, explosives, and communist pamphlets, having been issued vague instructions to sabotage important installations before killing Europeans indiscriminately. At least five of them were simply arrested before even getting very far. Another seven hoped to destroy a pylon carrying electricity to Sonoya in the northwest. Their faulty demolitions were uncovered by the Rhodesian security forces, and men were easily tracked to a nearby ranch on April 28th, where they were shot resisting capture. This event is considered to have become, been the first engagement of what later became known as the Rhodesian Bush War. The campaign proper is generally considered to have started in 1972 with the attack on Altina Farm, despite the minor threat already represented by nationalist movements in the 1960s. Soviet support went exclusively to Zapu while China supported ZANU. After the collapse of Portuguese rule in Mozambique in 1974-75, to it was no longer possible for the Smith regime to sustain European minority rule forever. By this time, even South Africa's Vorster had come to this view and said that, he need, that uh, Rhodesia needed to make concessions to Africans since it wasn't sustainable to maintain minority rule in a country where Africans outnumbered Europeans 22 to 1. In 19, until 1972, containing the guerrillas was little more than police action. However, the situation changed dramatically after the end of Portuguese rule in Mozambique in 1975. Rhodesia was now almost completely surrounded by hostile countries, and even South Africa, its only real ally, pressed it for a settlement. At this point, ZANU's alliance with the Frelimo, the liberation front of Mozambique, and the border between the two countries, enabled large-scale training and infiltration of ZANU slash ZANLA fighters. The governments of Zambia and Botswana were also emboldened and allowed resistance members to set up bases in their countries. Now, these guerrillas began to launch operations deep inside Rhodesia, attacking roads, railways, economic targets, and isolated security force positions in 1976. Now, the government responded by adopting a strategic hamlets policy to restrict the influence of the guerrillas over the population of rural areas. Local people were forced to relocate to protected villages which were strictly controlled and, and guarded by the government against rebel atrocities. A major problem for the Rhodesian state in fighting the bush war was always a shortage of manpower, and of the 3,000 European men liable for conscription in 1973, only about 1,000 actually reported when they were called up. In February 1978, the Rhodesian army stated that it needed a minimum of 1,041 men to continue combat operations, and of those called up, only 570 reported for duty while the rest chose to move to South Africa. The Rhodesian army, however, consistently outfought the ZANU and ZAPU guerrillas. However, European emigration caused a shortage of military 
power and only increased as the country called up more and more men to fight in the war. Now, in order to stop this, the government brought in a law in 1975 forbidding Rhodesians to hold foreign currency, but the law was widely ignored. In order to encourage this European emigration, the guerrillas of Zanu and Zapu followed a strategy of attacking anything and everything that was of economic value across the country in order to force the state to call out more men and of just killing Europeans. Now, Rhodesia began to lose uh, important economic and military support from South Africa, which, while sympathetic to the government, never officially recognized it. The South African government placed limits on the fuel and munitions they supplied to the Rhodesian military. They also withdrew the personnel and equipment they had previously provided to aid the war effort, although they secretly continued military support. Now, in the late 1970s, the militants had successfully put the economic the economy of Rhodesia under a lot of pressure, while the number of guerrillas in the countries was increasing. The government abandoned its early strategy of trying to defend the borders in favor of trying to defend key economic areas and lines of communication with South Africa, while the rest of the countryside became a patchwork of no-go areas. Nevertheless, guerrilla pressure inside the country was steadily increasing in the late 1970s, and by 1978-79 to 79, the war had become a contest between the guerrilla warfare placing more and more pressure on the government and the Rhodesian government strategy of trying to hold off the guerrillas until recognition for a compromise settlement with moderate African leaders could be secured. Now the shooting down on September 3, 1978 of the civilian Air Rhodesia plane, a uh, Vickers Viscount named the Hunyani in the Kariba area by Zipra fighters using a surface-to-air missile, the subsequent massacre of its survivors, is widely considered to be the event that finally destroyed the Rhodesians' will to continue the war. The Rhodesians' means to continue the war were also disappearing quickly. In December 1978, a Zanla unit penetrated the outskirts of Salisbury and fired a volley of rockets and incendiary device rounds into the main oil storage depot, the most heavily defended economic asset in the country. The storage tank burned for five days, giving off a column of smoke that could be seen 130 kilometers away and 79,000 uh, meters cubed of petroleum was lost. The government's defense spending also increased from 8.5% in 1971 to 47% by 1979. And in fact, in 1980, the government inherited $500 no, $500 million. Now, the Rhodesian army continued its mobile counteroffensive strategy of holding key positions or carrying out raids into the no-go areas. Well, e even though they were very successful in inflicting heavy guerrilla casualties, such raids were also usually unsuccessful in achieving their goal. Now, by 1978 to 1979, up to 70% of the army was composed of African soldiers, although most of the army and police reserves were European. Now, as a result of an internal settlement signed on March 3, 1978, between the government and the moderate African nationalist parties, uh, the United African National Council Party won a majority in this election, in its first election, and its leader, Abel Muzarewa, a Methodist bishop, became the country's first black prime minister on June 1, 1979, the country being renamed to Zimbabwe Rhodesia. The internal settlement left control of the country's police, security forces, civil ser service, and judiciary in European hands for the moment, and it also gave them about one-third of the seats in parliament. However, many, especially the guerrillas, were not happy with this, and even though it is described by the government as non-racial and democratic, it did not include the main nationalist parties, ZANU and ZAPU, and despite offers from Ian Smith, they refused to participate in an election, which they perceived as retaining strong European privilege. Now, Bishop Muzurewa's government did not receive recognition either, and the Bush War continued, and sanctions were not lifted. The international community refused to accept the validity of any agreement did, which did not incorporate the main nationalist parties. The British government issued invitations to all parties to attend a peace conference at Lancaster House. These negotiations took place in London in late 1979 and resulted in the Lancaster House Agreement. Declaration of Independence ended and Rhodesia would temporarily become British again with Lord Soames as governor. The Lancaster House agreement further provided for ceasefire which was followed 
by an internationally supervised general election held on February 1980. ZANU, led by Robert Mugabe, won this election. However, some people said this was because he terrorized his opposition, including supporters of ZAPU, although many people were not respecting the rules either. Now, the observers and Solons were, ac were accused of looking the other way, but Mugabe's victory was certified. Nevertheless, few could doubt that Mugabe's support within his majority Shona ethnic group was extremely strong. And on the day the election results became known, most European families had prepared plans for leaving the country, including the packing of cars and suitcases. Uh, however, after a meeting with Robert Mugabe and the Central Committee of ZANU, Ian Smith was reassured that Europeans could and should stay in the New Zimbabwe. Mugabe promised that he would strictly abide by the terms of the Lancaster House Agreement and that changes in Zimbabwe would become gradual and be legal. However, he would reverse his commitment to these agreements a few years later, and the regime began by confiscating European farmlands. Now, this is widely blamed for leading to the deterioration of the economy, which still plagues the country today. Anyways, thanks for watching.